What's going on, everybody? How's everyone doing tonight? Let's go. Thank you guys for the birthday wishes. I appreciate that. My team finessed me because I had no idea that was happening. Um, but I am so thankful to be a part of this house. I have the privilege of welcoming someone super special to the Victory family. Uh, this man of God has been so faithful over the years at Victory. And I have had the privilege of getting to know him and his family in this last season. And he's truly one of the most intentional wisest and most humble people I've ever met. And I believe that he like truly sought the Lord for us tonight. And I believe that you really truly need to be expectant for what he's about to bring because he doesn't hold back. You're gonna be convicted, you're gonna be challenged and we're gonna be able to grow from this message. And so can we stand and applause and give a great welcome to Pastor Darius Dunson. <laughs> What's up, young adults? Hold up, y'all stand back up and make some noise for Jesus up in this house, man. I get no glory. I get no glory. All glory goes to God. All glory goes to Jesus. If you've experienced him, you know what he does. You know he makes crooked paths straight. He takes us and takes us out of the miry clay. A lot of us was messed up, broke, busted, disgusted. God took us, set our feet on a rock, set us up, set us up, y'all. That's how good our God is. That's why we're here today. We're here today because we've experienced the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in times where we were not even looking for Jesus, but Jesus came and snatched us. Get your behind here and come on and follow me. I don't know about y'all, but that's how Jesus talks to me. Get your behind here, boy, and come follow me. <laughs> First of all, uh, shout out to Victory North Cobb, Young Adults. That's my crew there. Hallelujah. So, as I jump in. I just want to, first of all, uh, just acknowledge someone who is extremely special to me. I mean, uh, special to me. We've grown in relationship and we continue to grow in relationship. He's a man of God, a man of the word of God. He and his wife help to lead and they pastor each and every one of you. I want to give it up for Pastor Vance in the house real quick. Come on, give it up. Give honor where honor is due. Yes, yes. Well, it's good to be here today. Um, you know, I think it's a privilege for those of you who, have, who do not know me. My name is Pastor Darius. I am the pastor at Victory North Cobb. I've been at Victory for about 12 years. They're going to keep on, y'all, what, what? I'm at... <laughs> I've been at Victory, for, no, 14 years. I've been at Victory for 14 years. I've been pastoring for, for 28 years uh, up at this point. And some of y'all are like, man, I, he was pastoring before I was even thought of. Yes, I was. I was. It has been a journey. I've been at Victory, and I used to help to oversee this campus. And God called me, uh, to the, called me west to be in an area. I originally grew up in the metro Atlanta area in a, in a city called Mayretta. If you're from Mayretta, then you know you're from Mayretta because it's not Marietta. It's two <laughs> syllables, Mayretta. That's how we do it. And so I have the privilege of being able to serve not just that church, but to serve that community. And it is a privilege to be able to be able to share the word of God. And I want you to know tonight here in this room, you're blessed that you have pastors that love the word of God, Amen. that love the Bible. How many of you love the Bible? You have, here's the thing. 
The Bible is on every shelf. It is in mostly every house, but it is still a rare commodity because what happens is that Bible, if it's not open, it does not get to go in and open your heart. And that Bible, when it comes alive and comes into your heart, it does something to your life. And so this is what Pastors Vance and Pastor uh, Gabrielle get to do on a weekly basis in in young adults. And so I just want to say to you that you are blessed. I know this about Pastor Vance. If it came to whether he was going to make you feel good or give you more Bible, there would be nobody feeling good up in here. That's a blessing because in our season and in our time, we're inundated with people who would rather give you spiritual morphine and seduce you and sedate you instead of giving you the surgery of the word of God that can truly heal you. Because when it comes to morphine, it's just meant to allow you to die slowly without pain and allow you to die numb without conviction. And I'm telling you today, you are blessed to be in a house where people speak the word of God that make an incision into your heart where you did not know there was darkness and where you did not know that there was cracks and crevices and the enemy was trying to get in. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword and it divides asunder. Soul and spirit, joint and marrow. You know what that means? It divides your mind from the mind of God. And sometimes I myself personally don't know which way to turn, but the word of God comes in and tells me this is you and this is me. This is God and this is good. Notice I said that this is God, but this is good. And sometimes good is not God. But the Bible gives us clear instructions on how it leads us and discerns us and how it nurtures us and how it brings us back to life and brings us back to hell. That's why we're here tonight. I love it. Love the book. I love it that it's the history of stories of men and women who were challenged in a way that the Bible caused them to be inseparable with God, and to be able to serve God even in with the sight of of mountains, even at challenges that they did not know they would face, that the Bible has rescued many of us and rescued many of them. It is a story of men and women who followed after God, not knowing where, where they were going to go. They followed in faith. And here's what I love. I love when I read it, I get to see the full story, the full picture. And it has caused me in my life not to be impressed with none of us. Because I'm not impressed with people who can start anything. I'm impressed with people who can finish. Because there's a lot of people that start that don't finish, that start and don't finish. And I love it because when it comes to God, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And there's many people that used to be in this room that are not in this room. Now, some of them grew a little older and they had to go to the adult section. Amen. Can't be 45 in here. Come on, somebody. Hey, predator alert. Come on, Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to say it. Praise God. No, I'm just. <laughs> but when it comes to the Bible, it is a story of people who endure. And sometimes we look at the stories and we look at the people and we think that as they started the journey, they already knew that they were going to be in the lion's den. We think they knew that they were going to be carrying millions of people out of Egypt and were going to come to, to, to a Red Sea that needed to be parted. We think that they were different from who we are, but they faced the same fears, the same challenges, the st- same obstacles that we have in our mind. Come on. We face the same self-doubt. How many of you got self, self-doubt? How many of you have ever had imposter syndrome? Like you're in a room that you don't feel like you're supposed to be in. You feel inadequate. Half the time we 
we wake up, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what God is saying, but we sometimes we just get in a mode that we fake it until we can fit in or we fake it until we make it. But God knows the real story of who we are. Most of us here today, we're taking step one step, faith by faith, hoping that God will show up in the next step. And here what, here's what we read in the Bible. We read that as men took steps and women took steps, that God would show up in the steps that were ordained by him. And I'm telling us today that we're in a season right now that you're not going to be able to walk by what you see. You're going to have to be able to walk by faith. You're going to have to be able to walk by the leading of the spirit and the leaning of the spirit because what's going to happen, it is going to get too dark for your eyes to discern good from evil. What is happening in our generation and in our season today, that we're coming into a place that you're going to need the specific word of God for your life to be able to help you to discern your own path that God has you on. This is what we're dealing with. And so what I'm talking about today is that we're in a season that we have to run this race that we're in with the endurance that God has for us. It's not a sprint. That's good news for everybody. But there's all, that's also bad news for many of us. Because some of us, we start out well, but then that dude comes along. You know that dude. <laughs> or that girl comes along. Come on, fellas, amen. Can I get an amen in here? And then sanctify hole in this church? No, I'm just kidding. And get us distracted from the path that our heart yearned for, that we desired when we first gave, gave our life to Christ. We were yearning. We were saying, nothing is going to turn me around. Nothing is going to turn me back from Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. Ain't no turning back. I got my, my face focused forward. Nothing can stop what God is doing. But then we come into the distractions that are all around this world, on the internet, when you're scrolling out. You know what I'm talking about? Know how big your, your, your thumb muscles are from scrolling out? Come on, somebody. Some of y'all got some built thumb muscles. <laughs> when we think about Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joseph, all of them were in this journey. I'm going to put this down because I'm going to knock this over. All of them was on this journey, and they finished their, way, their race. They finished well. When we think about Paul, I want to, when Paul was talking about the end of his journey, he said, I fought a good fight. I ran my race. I remained faithful. Now is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. It's not about how we start. It's about how we finish. Now, just by a show of hands, how many in here believe and desire that you're going to finish well. Just show of hands. You're going to finish well. Just keep those hands up. Just keep them, keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up high. I'm going to tell you how, how, how many of you are going to finish well. Put your hands down first. Whoever put your hands down first, you ain't going to finish well. <laughs> you can put them down. You can put them down. That was just... Hey! That was a distraction. You can put them down for real this time. All right. Everyone say endurance. endurance. Now, here's what I need you to do. When I do like this to you, I need you to say endurance. endurance. Say it with some conviction. Endurance. Say it with more conviction. Endurance. Say it like you mean it. Endurance. Shout the devil down. Endurance. All right. I need participation tonight. Anytime I, do, anytime I do this tonight, I need feedback because when you give that ruach, it's, here's what it is. It's spirit, breath, wind. It's ruach. When you speak that in the atmosphere, it does something. It shatters certain things. It breaks strongholds. Your voice is powerful, and the, the enemy would love to do no greater thing than to shut your mouth because if he can shut your mouth, he can stop the word of God come, from coming out of your mouth. And if he can stop the word of God from coming out of your mouth, he can shift your, own, your whole direction. 
That's what the book of James tells us, that your tongue is a world of iniquity when it's used the wrong way. But it is life and death. If you use it the right way, it's a rudder that can turn your life in the right, the right way. So say endurance. endurance. Let's read this. Hebrews 12, 1. Are y'all ready to get in the word? Yeah. Hebrews 12 and 1. Therefore, reading from the New Living Translation. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses. Now, what he's talking about is the people that I just mentioned. Abraham, Joseph, Noah, Moses, David, all of these people are witnesses to your journey and your walk and specifically what we're going to say right here. A, such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Let us strip off Every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance. All right, y'all lost it. Come on, somebody. Run with endurance. Hey, there we go. The race God has set before us. All right, first point, I'm running my race. Everyone say race. I'm running my race. See, this is not a sprint. This is not a 40-yard dash. This is a marathon. And when it comes to running our race, one of the things that we have to understand when it comes to any race, that you cannot run with baggage. You can only go so far with baggage. You have to, you have to strip off some things in order for you to run for a long time. Paul, when he's saying this, he's, he's observing what is happening in the Olympics of that time, that he's observing in the races where people run, that they cannot run a long time with the wrong equipment. They have to lighten the load in order for them to run the race for the long haul. And that means that many of us, many of us, including myself, we've had to run for short periods of time with baggage until we understood that if I don't let this baggage go, I will not be able to move forward. I remember me. When I gave my life to Christ, I had a lot of baggage. When I say a lot of baggage, it was so much baggage. All types of baggage. The baggage of not, not having a father. My father at age eight years old. My mother and father got divorced and by, the age, by age 13, I did not see my father again until age 30. The baggage of, of not having a man in the home, a father in the house, the baggage, the baggage of, of drugs, full of drugs, marijuana, cocaine, age, from age 15 to 21, full of drugs. Everyone say baggage. baggage. Sex. <laughs> hey, if somebody gonna say it, let's go ahead and say it. Sex. Sex. The baggage of the baggage of sexual partners that you want to be free from. You want to be free from the images of it when you give your life to Christ, but the images of it and the memories of it, they don't go anywhere. And if you don't get free, you still have a soul tie that you have to carry with you until you can get true freedom. And you feel the pull of sexual partners reaching and grabbing after you and grabbing after your mind. The, the baggage of, of yearning for, to be loved, the baggage of wanting to be desired, the baggage of not knowing what you're going to do in your life, the baggage of the baggage for me personally, the baggage of probation, making bad decisions, going to jail, losing things, losing scholarships, just baggage. And what happens with baggage, if you don't get rid of it, it becomes your identity. Because oftentimes what happens, we make our baggage an accessory to who we are, not understanding that that's just something shiny in your past that you don't need to carry with you. 
Baggage, baggage walking with us that if we don't get rid of the baggage that is attaching itself, keeping itself, keeping strongholds over our life, if we don't allow God to get rid of those things in our life, we will find ourselves beginning to drift from the race, beginning to drift from the path that God has for, has for us, but we have to do something to get free from the baggage. What we have to do is allow our heart to be in God's hands so that he can reveal to us the things things that are a part of our identity that the devil has the things that are a part of our identity and the things that are not a part of our identity that the devil has attached to us things things that God never meant to define us things that God never meant to define you and I it took me years to get rid of the baggage of my past and the baggage that was walking with me in my life that I did not understand was keeping me back from following God. How about the baggage of relationships? The baggage of friends that we stay loyal to. Loyalty to people more than we have loyalty to God. Come on, somebody. Am I talking to somebody in here? Loyalty, loyalty to our status, loyalty to our old neighborhoods, loyalty to our fraternities, loyalty to our sororities. Now I'm hitting it now. Come on. Loyalties, loyalties that begin to be more loyal. We are more loyal to people than we're loyal to God. And God is saying all of that right there is just baggage. When it comes time for you to ascend to where I'm calling you to ascend to, you will not be able to go higher with all those people on your ankles. You will not be able to go higher with all those people in your heart. You will not be able to go higher with all those people in your loins. Everyone say baggage. No, 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 no. All right, all right. So let me, let me, all right, all right, all right. I don't mess y'all up. All right, all right, all right. All right, I don't mess. Don't always go back to endurance now. All right, all right. So we Say what I say, but say it with authority, okay? All right, all right. Say Jesus. Jesus. All right, so when I say do J Jesus, Jesus, don't say endurance. All right, no cop. They, they loyal. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So I'm running, I'm running my race. We have to be stripped of all of our badges. Here, let me ask you something. What are you carrying other than your cross? To the people in the back, to the right, what are you carrying other than your cross? Now, this is important to understand because there are some things that are good for you that are not God. I already said that. But God things don't always feel good. Crosses don't always feel good. Leaving people behind because you have to get healthy within yourself and maintain your mental health does not always feel good because you have familiarity with people. You have f familiarity with cities. You have familiar familiarity, that's hard to say, familiarity with colleges. You have familiarity with places and things that when you begin to break free from it, it has a pull on you that begins to pull you back. And it's not good to bear the cross of leaving people behind without them understanding why. When I gave my life to Christ, the hardest thing for me to do was to tell my people that I walked with, that I'd been in, been in elementary school with, to tell them, look, bro, look, I love y'all, but I got to go. Don't call me. I'll call you. <laughs> true story. No, true story. I had, to tell, I had to tell the guys that I grew up with, don't call me. I'll call you. And here's why. Here's why I had to do that. Because every time I got with them, I had the baggage of non-transformity. I knew I had changed. I knew I was a different person. The day I gave my life to Christ, I knew I was a different person. I still smelled like marijuana, but I was different. So I went to my friends, I said, hey man, I ain't doing that no more. They were like, yeah, right, bro, get this right here. No, I'm different, no, I'm different for real. I don't, I'm not going to the, to the club anymore. I'm not going to the strip club anymore. I'm not going to that place with y'all. I'm not going to the hotel with y'all. I'm not doing that. You, 
No, you, you'll come around. Just get in the car. To break free from people who did not understand, people who loved me but did not know how to love me the way God loved me, to break free from those people was extremely difficult. And I can guarantee you in the room like this, some of you are torn between people and God, torn between people you love, some of them family members, some of them sisters and brothers, whether you're going to hang with them and, and, and not be transformed or whether you're going to go with God and be transformed. Not because you cannot do both in the same, but you have to understand where you are. We got to have self-awareness in here. Some of us are not strong enough to hang where we used to hang and still be free. I know I wasn't. I wasn't strong enough to stay in the same environment and still be free. Everyone say baggage. baggage. Hebrews 12, 2. He says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. So... I'm running my race. Number two, I'm seeking God's face. We're going to rhyme all, all up in here. Like, y'all going to remember this message. It says, keeping your eyes on Jesus. Now, I, I, want, you, I want you to notice something about this. It's not enough to just lighten the load. You have to know where you're going. You have to know who you're pointed towards, who you should be going after. What is like, we know the starting line, but what is the finish line? Because if the enemy can place any other finish line than Jesus and the throne room of God, he will definitely catch you in a snare. If he can catch you with any other finish line, if your finish line is just a good career, If your finish line is just to get married, if your finish line is just to just to uh, get one hundred thousand dollars a year, if your finish line is just to be in ministry, if your finish line is that low, you're looking too low. You got to go higher. You're the high call of Jesus Christ to see Jesus's face and not just to have his hand work in your life, not just to experience his blessing, but also to experience his presence, to know him and the power of his resurrection, to be known by him and to hear him say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into my rest, to be loved by him, to see him just as you are and to know him just as you are known. If your finish line is anything shorter than that, then the end enemy will put a, put a stronghold in your life, will put a snare in your life that will block you from getting to where you need to go. So we have to have our eyes, our focus, our face fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, because there's a lot of things to distract us. You know the scripture, what profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? It also says, and what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Many of us were aiming too low. Do you understand that your value to Jesus is worth more than anything in this world? that you were bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that the value that you have in him is meant, is, it can't even be measured, that how he knows you and how he died for you, how he gave his life for you, the scripture is telling us, what would you give in exchange for this? The world in exchange for your soul is not an even exchange. I love how Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, gold is nothing but dust to a dying man. Gold is nothing but dust to a dying man. What it's saying is eternity is far greater, costs far more than anything that we can pay, that we can pay for. And here, here's what we see. Here's what we see. People find treasure... 
and trade treasure for trash every day. What is, what is treasure? Seeing the face of Jesus. He is our treasure. He is all that we should hope for, all that we should ever want. But people trade that treasure for trash every day. If you're not running the race that God has for you, and there's many times that you may get off course. There's many times that you may be distracted, but you have to self-correct and get yourself on course with what God has for you. Because what God has for you is far better than anything that the world could ever offer. I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine today where would I be without Jesus. How many of y'all got that testimony? Like, like he's done so much in your life already. He's turned your life all around already. He's done miracles in your life. He's healed your heart. He's forgiven you. He's given you the ability to forgive. All of that Jesus has done in your life. Can you imagine how much Jesus will do in your life if you continue? If you don't get weary in doing what he called you to do? The scripture says if you don't get weary in doing what God called you to do, you will continue to reap if you don't give up. Turn to somebody and say don't give up. Don't ever give up. See, we have to get to a place where we say, I'm done with good, just good. I'm done with gold, and I just want God. We have to get to a place that God is far more greater than anything that we could ever want and receive in this world. So we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And look where it says he's at. Where, where it says he is. He says, now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Someone say, watch the throne. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the throne. We have to think higher. Think about what this is. Now, here's when I say think higher. You have to understand where you are. Colossians 3 and 1 said that you're raised with Christ. You have to keep your head higher, your value higher. Your value, your value is much more higher than giving your body away to some man or some woman. Your value is much more higher than trading it for a career, trading your life with Christ for a career that pulls you away from the path of God. Your value is much more higher than someone who spoke to you and tell, told you that you would never be anything that you would never accomplish anything, that you, are, you, that you are a mistake. Your value is much more higher than that. We have to raise our, our heads and our head and get it high to where God has us to be. Some, let's do this. Everybody just stand up. Let's just stand higher one time. Come on, somebody. Let's stand higher. I want you to just stand up. Stand up with me. I want you to read this because there's some people in here that you need to tell yourself something different about yourself. When we say keeping our face on Jesus, we're not just saying keeping our face on Jesus. We're saying keeping our face on the throne room of God, keeping our aim for eternity. And there's a lot of things that are going to come in, our, come in this life, but God has far greater for us. I want us to read this together. Let's read this. Ephesians 2, 1 through 6. Now, we're going to read this together. Keep it up there. Keep it up there. Uh, Y'all, whoever read that, read real fast. Man. <laughs> this, 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 I call this the NLT remix because I switched it up. I put your name in here, all right? The eyes, and in, instead of saying we, I put I. Look at this. Let's read, the, read, read this together. And I need us to read this with some authority. Are y'all ready? Yeah. Say it. Once I was dead because of my disobedience and my many sins. I used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He was the spirit at work in my heart when I refused to obey God. Say all us. Now, now take the of out. We, hey, hey, we're in Atlanta. Say all us. Look around and say all us. Just in case you thought you were by yourself in your sin, all y'all got some sin. I know some of y'all were judging me by having a record. All us, say all us. Come on, somebody. All us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclination of our sinful nature. 
Come on, come on, let's go. Come on. Next, next, next verse. There we go. By our own very nature, all of us were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved me so much that even though I was dead because of my sins, he gave me life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that I have been saved. For he raised me from the dead along with Christ and seated me with him. Stop right there. Stop right there. I need you to see that. I need you to understand. I need you to understand from God's point of view. When you're looking at the throne, you're looking at the place that you're seated with him in. That it's not just Jesus on the throne. We're seated with him in heavenly places. Come on, somebody. Your value, your value is much higher than you thought it was. You're not just a beggar in the kingdom. You're a son. You're a joint heir in the kingdom. God loved you enough not just to bring you into the house. God loved you enough to give you his DNA. All us. (laughs) Seated me with him. In the heavenly realms, because I am united with Christ Jesus. Turn to somebody and say, are you united with Christ? Amen. Hallelujah. You can have a seat. Go ahead and give Jesus a hand clap of praise for that. See, when you know who you are and you know whose you are and you know who you belong to, belong to, it makes it just a little bit easier to leave the past behind. It makes it a little easier to leave the lies behind. Because I'm going to tell you, one of the reasons why it's hard for us to stay focused is not because the lies come from within. The lies come from, from the outside. Sometimes we think every thought that we think comes from us as if there's not a devil and a demon that's whispering into us lies at all types of points in our life. If the devil can whisper to to Peter, who had just told Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, who do you think you are that the devil will not lie to you? The devil lied to Peter in the face of Jesus. So we have to strike down the lies, the hidden lies about who you are, the hidden lies about the hidden lies that the enemy continues to try to put generational curses on you. Do not claim that for yourself. You are seated with him in heavenly places. Come on, somebody. So we have to leave things behind. I love this scripture in Luke. Chapter 17, verse 32, Jesus is talking, and he says these three words. He says, remember Lot's wife. Have you ever read that and realized that, that, see, the reason why Lot's wife turned around is because she was walking away from the thing that she loved so much. She had built her house on sand, not realizing that her treasure was not in the now, her treasure was in the future. If she would have just kept her face looking forward, following what God had said, leaving behind the past, letting that thing go, if she would have just kept focusing on what Jesus said, focusing forward, then she would have been okay. But the problem is, is that we love, we love where we've been so much, even if where we've been was not even good for us. Because we're familiar with it. But God is calling us to, trans, to be transformed in my, our mind, to love something different, to see something different, to love Jesus, to be with him, to desire him, to hunger after him. But it's not, not always easy. So we have, to, we have to push forward. Let that stuff go. So how do we do that? We already said it. I'm running my race. I'm seeking God's face. We got another rhyme. Here we go. I'm keeping my pace. 
Come on, somebody. Bars, snap, snap. <laughs> Y'all know I'm an old man, though. You know that, right? right? So my rhymes are like old school rhymes. Don't push me. <laughs> Edge. Second Corinthians 6, 14. <clears throat> I want you to see this. Pace, pace, is, pace is a little different because what you're a part of, I don't think sometimes you realize what life would be without what you're a part of right here. Look what it says. Second Corinthians 6, 14. It says, do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have, have righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness. I want you to see this. Partnership is a physical and emotional and sometimes an intellectual bond. Many times our partnerships and who we partner with in life, sometimes we choose life coaches that are not good for us. It's a partnership. Sometimes, sometimes we choose people, associations that are not good with us. That's a partnership. But look at this other one. Fellowship. That is a spiritual and emotional bond. Your relationship with another person is a spiritual and emotional bond. And if you are walking in relationship with someone who is going towards darkness while you're trying to go towards light, how many of you know that that affects your pace? That affects, how, that affects how you can run this race with endurance. This is why this is important. I want you to understand this. This is extremely important. When I say this, I'm saying being in young adult community because there is a pace setter here. That Jesus sets the pace in this atmosphere with his word. Pastor Vance is an under-shepherd of Jesus who is the great shepherd to help set the pace for Pastor Vance. And what happens is when you're in an environment where everybody is running at the same pace, it's hard to fall behind because you will be noticed when you're in a group of people. You hear what I'm saying? So if you're not in pace-setting environments, spiritually facing Jesus, going towards the throne of heaven where Jesus is seated and where you're seated with him in heavenly places, you cannot afford, you cannot afford to be distant and disconnected and isolated from an environment that is helping you set the pace for your eternal salvation. And many people feel like, I'm okay with God. I got my own relationship with God at home. I'm chilling with God at my home. Not understanding that while they are chilling at God, they're setting their own pace. Oftentimes inundated with voices in this world that, will, that is trying to pull them back. Inundated with family members and things that they're seeing on the internet that is pulling them back. Not realizing that there are, there are attacks of the enemy and things that are attaching themselves to them because they are not in the safety of the believers. This is why Jesus gave power and authority not just to one person. He gave power and authority to the church, to the assembly. There's no power. Oh, man, I just had like two people that said... If you don't understand that the power and the authority is in the gathering of believers, a lot of times we quote the scripture exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in me. No, it's not me. According to the power that works in us. And some people are bound because you're not connected strong enough, allowing yourself to have a pace set spiritually, emotionally, physically, so that you can brush through all the barricades of the enemy that he's setting up against you. Everyone say pace. pace. Say it one more time. Pace. All right. Y'all with me? Yeah. Hebrews 12, 3. Think of all the hostility. He endured from sinful people. Now, let me just say this. Some of you may be saying, Pastor, I'm running my race. <clears throat> I'm seeking God's face. I'm keeping my pace. But I still got all these problems happening in my life. I still have all these challenges happening in my life. 
I'm still coming against all these obstacles. Here's, here's what I'm saying. The reason why I told you about Noah and Abraham and, and Joseph is because you're not alone. They had problems too. They had challenges too. The reason why it's called endurance is because you have to fight through some things. This is why Paul said, I fought the good fight of faith. That it is, this, is, this is not just some free will walk that if you find yourself on the yellow brick road, there's nothing that's going to attack you. There's going to be great doors of opportunity, but with much adversity coming your way. Do you understand when we're talking about Paul? Paul, while he's doing what God called him to do, he's on his way to his destination, on his way to Rome, and he finds himself in a shipwreck. Now, why? Why does that happen to me? And I don't know many times people turn their back on God because they feel like seemingly bad things happen to them. This book is not about bad things not happening to us. This book right here is about what God does with us through the bad things that happen to us. It's how God fortifies us, gives us strength and power to walk through and to keep walking. Paul is shipwrecked. He gets to the island of Malta. He makes, makes a fire after he's wet and, and, and been shipwrecked. He's bending over the fire and a snake comes out and bites him while he's reaching in the fire. Now, how many of you would have been done right there? Like, I like, all right, say, you know what? Let's just go back. Uh, you know what? This, I, I was good. I was good, Lord. I was good, Lord, with the, with, the, with, the, with the ship and the sharks. But when it comes to them snakes, I can't do no snakes. Come on, somebody. But we think it's strange when fiery trials happen to us. And the enemy sets ploys and decoys. Job lost his whole family. Sometimes we forget about that. He, he lost his whole family. He lost his livelihood. He lost his health. And I know preachers lie. Come on, somebody. And tell you if you just do this, everything is going to be great and good. I have not read that about anybody in the Bible. Our Savior and Lord, while he's doing the will of God in the Garden of Gethsemane, is sitting there contemplating, asking God, does it have to be done that way? Lord, if it's, Lord if, is there any other way that this can be done? How, how many of you have said that? Is there any other way that this could be done? Nevertheless, I'll do it your way. Jesus is saying to us, listen, even if you do everything right, that does not mean that trials and challenges and suffering is not going to come your way. But don't be afraid of that. Don't, be, don't, don't, don't pull back because of that, because in that is where my glory is going to be revealed in you. This is what Paul understood. This is what the Bible is talking about. Look at this. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people talking about Jesus. Then you won't become weary and give up. Turn to somebody and say, don't give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. Some of the things that we go through, we think it's calamity when it's correction. For the Lord disciplined those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Look at this. Who ever heard of a child who was never disciplined by his father? I'm running my race. I'm seeking God's face. I'm keeping my pace. I'm receiving number four. 
Somebody say. Listen. What you don't know is this. There's so many things that could have happened to you that did not happen to you. See, there's a story behind the story of why you're here. You know what Satan said? Have you considered my servant Job? And if God didn't say, hey, you can only touch this, he would have struck Job dead right away. But he said, only do this. Satan said, look, if you do this, he'll curse you to your, to your face. Not Job. Not you. I want you to be one of those true Christian believers that don't just follow God when things are good. That don't just follow God when everything is going right. If it was, if everything had to go right, I would have, man, I would have stopped following God the day my wife was given six months to live. I would have stopped following God while I'm in the studio recording my second uh, Christian hip hop album. Yeah, I used to do Christian rap. That's who that. It used to sound just like that. No, I got bars though for real. While y'all playing, like <laughs> that's pride. That's pride. Lord forgive me. That's pride. <laughs> Talking about some pace, face, race. <laughs> that ain't no. What? That ain't no boss. I would have given up. I'm in the studio and, my, and, and the, I have a Bell's palsy just strike my face. Plenty of opportunities to give up. But see, when God delivered me and I felt like the love of Jesus and the God of the universe called my name, that's different, y'all. I was done. Like when he called my name and I knew the God who created the universe called me and knew me and, and, and loved me enough to pull me out of where I was into the man that he was calling me to be. Here's what I said, Lord, I don't like it, but I love you and I'm, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going forward. I'm going to keep pressing in. I'm going to keep doing what you call me to do. Too many times we, for, we give up while God is setting us up to be strong enough, not just to deliver ourselves, but to be strong enough to give us a story of deliverance that can deliver your whole family, that can deliver your whole generation. He wants you to be a blessing to all nations of the earth to bless. And that ain't just money. The biggest blessing that anybody could receive is eternal life with Jesus Christ. To know him. Listen, the, to know not just the treasures of earth, but to know the treasures of heaven. To be able to experience him. This is what Paul understood. This is what Noah understood. This is what Joseph understood. This is what Abraham understood. This is what Job understood. Though you slay me, yet I will trust you, God. This is what Jesus understood. This is what Peter, while he's being crucified, says, no, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Turn me upside down, being crucified upside down because he trusted that the God who killed him would be able to resurrect him the same way he rose Jesus from the dead. Because he knew Jesus had already told him. He had already seen him. He saw Jesus say to a thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. He knew when he went down, he was going up with Jesus. Amen. And that's how we have to be. That's who God has called us to be. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 9. It says, even though I've, I've received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud... I was given a thorn in my flesh. This is Paul talking. A messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best when? Weakness. Too many people want power and don't want weakness. 
We want power and strength and not power and weakness, not understanding that in order for you to be in a place of weakness, sometimes you have to be stripped. So when it talks about stripping off all these things that hinder us in the race that we're running, sometimes we strip things off of ourselves and sometimes things are stripped off of us by God. Don't despise his chastening. What child have you ever heard of who doesn't receive discipline from a father? Now, are you a child of God? Hebrews 4.14, it's my last scripture. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he's faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we, there we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Look at this. Grace to do what? Grace to help. I want you to know today that wherever you are in your race, there is grace. You need help from God, you ask for help from God. You need you need. Help to keep moving forward, you ask for the help of God to help you move forward. Now, here's what I'm saying. I want you to stand to your feet. See, Jesus didn't just die on the cross and send you his word. He also sent you his spirit, his helper, to help you to run this race. And I feel like the reason why the Lord gave me this this sermon today, this message, is because there's some people in here that you're on the spectrum of giving up. You've kind of you've kind of taken some steps back. You've made a few mistakes, and you hear the accuser of the brethren assigning identity to your mistake. And the Lord is saying, "I know you did that, but that's not you. You may have made that mistake." You may have fell into that into that sin, but that is not who you are. That's not you. I know who you are. You're my child. Listen, while you were doing much worse things, I called you. So don't let the enemy tell you that that you have reached a point where the grace of God cannot reach you. Here's what we know about the grace of God. Where sin abounds, grace does much more. That there is much more, there is much more grace than there is sin in this world. Come on, somebody. And there's much more grace and there's much more help for you. I want you to keep running the race. I want you to, I want you to keep seeking his face. I want you to keep the pace of God with the people in this room. I want you to keep receiving God's grace. I want you to keep going after God in spite of yourself. There's plenty of trials. There's plenty of mistakes I've made in these 28 years following Christ. There's been plenty of things that I've done wrong, but I just kept getting back up. Listen, I just kept getting back up. I just knew I didn't have any other place to turn. I knew my race said, go this way. I knew my lane was right here, and I knew my finish line was Jesus, so I just didn't have, I didn't set a time. I got to get there, so I'm going to keep pushing forward. I love a story of an Olympic runner named John Stephen Aquari in the 1968 Olympics. He was a marathon runner. And he gets about halfway into the marathon, and because he's running at a different height, his knees begin to buckle, and he bumped into another runner, and he fell down, had a bad injury, a bad gash in his leg, and, and he should have given up. He was still about 17 miles away from the finish line. But he said, look, I'm going to keep running as long as I can. He reaches the finish line just about an, a little over an hour after the, the, the first person won the race or the last person finished the finish line. The lights are getting ready to go out. There's just a few people that are clapping, clapping for him to walk through the finish line. And then he finishes. He, he walks past the finish line. And then someone says to him, so why didn't you give up? And he makes this statement, this is profound, because it speaks to who we are and how we should approach the race that we're in. He said, my country didn't send me 5,000 miles to start a race. 
My country sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. Jesus did not call you so that you can start. He called each and every one of us so that we can finish. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I just give you praise and glory. I thank you. Come on now, guys. We give you praise and glory. I thank you for your presence. Thank you for your purpose. Thank you for your life. And I pray right now that each and every person in this room, under the sound of my voice, Lord, I pray that you begin to speak to them about where they are in the journey, where they are in the race, the story that you're writing with them, what you're saying to them right now. Many different aspects of this message have hit many different points. And so I pray, Lord, that each and every person that may be dealing with leaving the past behind, leaving people behind that aren't able to go with them in this season, leaving addictions and leaving habits and asking for your help and your grace to help them to overcome. Father, I just shout grace over each and every person's life right now. The help of the Holy Spirit over each and every person to give supernatural quickening power to break the chains of bondage, to break the chains of bondage of the lies of the enemy. I speak against every lie that has been spoken over these people in Jesus' name. I speak identity as children of God in Jesus' name. Each and every person individually, uniquely loved by the Father. I thank you, Father, that even now identity is coming back, that they're rekindling a flame of fire inside of them, the flame that they had when they first gave their life to you. Lord, I pray that you continue to restore. Bring it back, Lord. Bring it back. Bring them back to the feet of the cross so that they can understand that their blood bought, that the price that you paid for them is much more precious than gold, that it's much more precious than the world can offer, that you love them with immense love to bring them into to heavenly places with you. I pray in Jesus' name that if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that doesn't feel like they can be free, I shut the mouth of the enemy right now in Jesus' name. We declare freedom in Jesus' name. We declare liberty in Jesus' name right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Now here's what, here's what I want you to do. Listen. With boldness. We're, we're getting ready to go back into worship. There's some decisions that need to be made. Now, we're going to go into worship as a sign of, of moving forward in Jesus Christ and stepping out of a mundane, mediocre, mediocre life of Christianity. If you say, look, today, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. I hear what God is saying to me. I'm not staying where I am. I'm moving forward. I'm going to run my race with fervency. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to follow after God with my whole heart. I want you to just meet me right here at this altar. Go ahead and do it right now. Don't hesitate. Do it right now. I'm going to run this race. I'm going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm going to finish well. I'm not just starting. I'm going to finish what God has started. Jesus began a good work, and Jesus is going to finish the work with, with my participation. I'm going to yield myself to you. I'm going to allow you to do what you need to do in me, God. That's what he's asking of us. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray over us, over us right here. And here's what I'm... Here's what I have to give to you. Because you can't impart anything that you, that you don't have. Here's what, here's what I can tell you. I told our congregation this. I said, I'm so grateful to the Lord. I gave my life to the Lord 28 years ago in my mother's home on her living room floor. And I have never lost my fire for Jesus. Never. I want you to hear what I'm saying. See, you can keep a fire in the midst of mistakes. You can keep a fire in the midst of your, your human frailty. 
But you can keep a focus and keep your focus on Jesus. Keep looking unto him, the author and the finisher of your, of your faith. Now, I just want to pray a fresh fire over you. Now, when I pray this, the other thing that I want, to know, want you to know, if you have not been baptized because you're feeling like, you know what, I need to get some things right, I need to fix some things. Listen, all of that is baggage. Here's one of the things that we do. We just say, God, I know you're going to help me. I'm going to go in just as I am. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in. I'm going to leave this baggage to you. I'm going to leave these, all these things that I'm, I'm thinking about that I may not be able to do. I'm leaving it with you. I'm going down the old man, and I'm coming up the new man. That is, that is my intention of my heart. I want everybody who's in the back, I want you to just point your hands. If you have faith for the fire of God to fall over the people of God, I just want you to point your hands right here. Father, we just pray right now in Jesus' name that the fire of God will just fall over each and every one of these people's lives. Father, we thank you that the fire of God is here to burn away all the dross. We thank you that the fire of God is here is to set us ablaze for you, to give us passion for you, to give us love for you, to give us desire for you, to rekindle what we thought we lost, stir up the love that we thought we lost. Father, the fire is here to burn away ungodly relationships in Jesus' name. The fire is here to burn away dis uh, destructive addictions in Jesus' name. The fire is here to burn away any attachment to the world that is causing us to shrink back. I believe the fire of God is here to set us ablaze, to be living sacrifices for God, to be an ever-burning incense of the presence of God. I believe the fire of God is here so that we can be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I believe the fire of God is here to be witnesses in our schools, to be witnesses in our our homes to be witnesses in our relationships the fire of God is here so that we can know you more Jesus because you make your ministers your servants your sons and daughters a flame of fire so we just give you praise and glory right now in Jesus name we believe it is done we receive it we accept it we know that we're accepted in you in Jesus name now can I get about two or three people in this house to give me a huge hallelujah. Here's my second prayer. If you're down here and you've never received Jesus Christ, or if you're anywhere in the building and if you never received Jesus Christ, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father. Say it with some authority. Say, Father, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for me. I believe he went in the grave and he rose again on the third day for me. I repent of my sin. I surrender my heart. I surrender my life. I surrender my all. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me new. Make me clean. Help me to run this race. To finish well. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen. 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 amen.